the idea is that uh, you have a searchable, decentralized uh, platform to search for transparently reported studies along, uh, actually it's more like five dimensions. Uh, and so we're using the open science practices, or rather open practices badges developed by the Center for Open Science. This orange badge is to represent whether the experimental materials have been publicly hosted on a public repository. The red badge is whether the study has been pre-registered uh, at a uh, registered registry, at a centralized registry, and or has followed the registered reports format, which is uh, led by Chambers, Chris Chambers and Cortex, but is now spread to many other journals, where you submit a protocol uh, prior to data collection and then they accept it uh, based on the methodology and the rigor of the study design. Uh, and then the blue data badge is whether the data has been posted on a public repository. Uh, and we're adding a reporting standard badge, which also reflects methodological disclosure statements, which is another name that is known under. And that's what I mentioned about what Penelope AI is doing, where depending on the study design, the authors must uh, confirm that they've disclosed uh, all items required in these uh, reporting guideline checklists. For example, so Psych Science is one of the journals that are awarding these badges. Uh, but one thing to mention is that in, in most areas of social science, you have multiple studies in a paper. And so the curation of transparency has to be done at the study level. For example, this paper earned a pre-registration badge. However, only study three was pre-registered. Right? So not all studies were pre-registered. And so, uh, and then we link the pre-registration to the badge. And so when you click on the badge, you are brought to the pre-registration uh, on the repository that was chosen. Because there are different uh, registries. There's the OSF. And this tells you that it's frozen, not editable, and then you can scrutinize it. So for example, this one is actually not very thorough. So this is better than nothing, right? But it's a bit skimpy. Um, and so again, falsifiability would be lower if you have a half a page for registration compared to a 20 page for registration. Uh, and so another repository is called as predicted, or rather a registry. And again, they go for efficiency. It's only eight questions. So again, pre-registering eight pieces of information is better than zero. Uh, but if someone pre-registers 15 pages of details, right, uh, that would be uh, potentially can be considered more credible, assuming no errors and flaws have been found. And so, for the reporting standards uh, on Hover, you actually can get the information. And so this is a basic full reporting standard that was uh, initiated by uh, Simmons, Simonson, and Nelson. And then we uh, promoted it at psychdisclosure.org. And then the success of our initiative led Psych Science, Psychology, Selection, and Empirical Journal to adopt those standards since 2014. And so this actually tells you uh, that this study has disclose all of the excluded observations, all of the experimental conditions that were tested, all of the outcome measures that were assessed, and then also how they determine the sample size. Right. Um, and, uh, because again, before this standard, uh, there was no way of knowing. I mean, you would just have to trust that the person is honest, but you have no way of saying, you have no way of knowing if they were fooling themselves, and they just justified, oh, this measure is not so good, or this, uh, we wanted to leave out, not to cause any, or raise any eyebrows. And so as another example, to make it even more accessible, is that we curate the study file information, and then you can download the files directly uh, from this hover window, and then actually view the file directly in the table. And so this is the file that's hosted at the OSF, uh, but you can actually uh, peruse it directly from this searchable uh, table. Uh, whether you're criticizing it, whether you want to do a replication, 
whether you want to reuse the data for a generalizability study. Uh, and this is this, the case for uh, the data files as well. So you can view uh, the data file and make sure everything looks kosher. Because uh, often even just a quick glance reveals that, okay, they report 200 participants and there's only 20 participants in this data file. There's got to be something wrong. Going back to the disclosure standards, uh, Rebecca actually has been taking uh, the lead at what we're calling the Basic 7 Retroactive <laughs> Reporting Standard, which is three more than the Basic 4. So again, the Basic 4 was excluded observations, uh, experimental conditions, outcome measures, sample size. Uh, but the three next most fundamental are what can be called analytic plans, which is actually disclosing whether the analytic plans were decided prior to data collection, uh, so that we can get a sense of how much the uh, analyses were uh, se selected uh, or cherry-picked uh, for studies that were done before the advent of the registration, right? Because, of course, you can't go back and then we believe that you can go back in time and create your studies. Uh, but uh, we actually can't go back in time. So this is a way to make uh, more research more valuable, and Rebecca will present, I think, after my talk, more details about this uh, basic seven. Uh, another category is whether there was any other related studies that were not reported in the published paper. So often pilot studies, failed pilot studies, or other studies that somehow didn't make it into the published article. And then any other disclosures that would help uh, reviewers or community members uh, better interpret the, the credibility of the evidence and or other details needed for replication. Uh, and again, uh, this will be presented and then uh, linked to the original retroactive disclosure statement. So this is the same idea, except it's uh, on hover. So when the data is available, uh, you can actually Link to what's called Code Ocean, and they have a very nice embeddable interface. So again, this is an embeddable capsule that you can run uh, remotely, and you organize the syntax files uh, over here, the data down here, and then you can literally run the code not just within your browser but within a hover window from this searchable decentralized. Uh, platform and then actually run the syntax directly from this window and confirm that the results uh, reproduce the reported results, or rather that the syntax files reproduce the reported results. There are other platforms, but we see this platform as most uh, promising, and they've also they've already partnered up with institutions like IEEE to quell the concern that they're just you know, kind of sell out again because they are, to my understanding, a for profit uh, tech company. My final example is that we're linking PDFs, which are great, but PDFs are static and not very interactable. And so we also will link to interactive HTML articles that embed these computational capsules. And this, this one, oh, it's political science. I was going to show this F1000. And so these are HTML articles that actually uh, embed the computational uh, capsules directly into the text, HTML text. Because of course you can't embed uh, a website inside a PDF. But you can embed interactive, I don't know what it's, And again, this allows higher levels of falsifiability because you can check the data, check the syntax, and actually rerun the analyses, and most likely rerun different analyses. And that's the robustness part that I didn't talk about. But you also want to make sure that, because often there are other statistical analyses that were equally justifiable, that could have been run, that were not. And you want to make sure the report results are robust to different statistical analyses, which you could do right here, and then actually add a syntax file and say, oh, I've tested the sensitivity of these results, and they appear robust. But again, this is down the road. We're focusing on transparency. 
But again, transparency, reproducibility, replicability uh, are all ways to attempt to falsify hypotheses. So we want to link to HTML articles which are more interactable, more actionable. This is not just making your research transparent, it has to be findable, accessible, and actionable, interactable, to be able to maximize the chance of finding errors and correcting them as quickly as possible. Thank you very much.